fastest growing trends in European healthcare is private insurance. What happens when the government replaces professionals in the delivery of health care? We distort the market. Also, we destroy it. I mean, there is, if you don't allow competition, then we are dead. And this is what we have seen. I'm so thankful to what Congressman Escalisa just said when he mentioned that if we import uh, price control to Europe, uh, from Europe to the United States, we will not centralize <coughs> medicine here in the U.S. Trust me, we've seen it in Europe. This is no good. If we just look at the budget of the Western European countries who spent two-thirds on welfare and medicine, two-thirds. So what is left for education, defense, and other important things? Not much. So be careful, don't fall into this trap of the centrally planned uh, thing that we call socialized healthcare. And we have this in all of our European countries to a bigger and a lesser extent. But what, what everything has in common, it doesn't allow choice. You're forced to take whatever you get unless, as you mentioned before, you're able to afford private insurance. And the issue is it's not a competition between private insurances and state insurance. No, you have to take Barbara, isn't it true that healthcare in Europe is free? Oh, I've never seen something such a free thing provided by government. I mean, as Lady Thatcher once said, eventually they take your money until they run out of it. It's taxpayers' money. It's our money that they take. So it's nothing for free. There is no free lunch in healthcare. The other thing that, the other thing that you hear from democratic socialists, either democratic or socialist, or democratic socialist, is that there's a European system of healthcare that works beautifully for everybody. Is that anything other than just a lie? Well, of course it works beautifully, but look at our budgets. Look at the, uh, the debts we build on it. And we, as the taxpayers, have to pay for it. So in each and every country, the taxpayers pay more and more every year for each and every service you add. And you know, as we talk about markets, there's a wonderful example when General Clay and Ludwig Gerhardt abolished price control in, the, in 1945, back in 1948. The German economic miracle started. And you mean government actually gets in the way of economic development? Oh, of course. I, doesn't this happen in the United States sometimes as well? It depends who you ask. Exactly. And if you look at Europe, and we have those huge bureaucracies, then, you know, it's there for the rest of you. And you're still in a much better position, but you know we have to warn you. Well, don't, don't copy paste these, uh, these ideas. They will destroy you. Here, here. Thank, thank you for coming here and telling the truth. It's a short supply. Well, you know, and after all, it's a pleasure. But you know, this is we have to look at the moral high grounds of the markets versus politics versus interest politics. And I think it's us, the individuals, who need the choice. And therefore, the moral high ground is on our side. We need to own that. Exactly. We need to defend that. Congressman Collins said earlier, we need to get off our behinds and stop being so polite about this. This is really almost literally, in healthcare, a life and death situation for us. If we look back, I mean, Adam Smith told us a couple of centuries ago that markets work. They work with the butcher, they work with the baker, and they work also with the pharmacist. So we should look at that, and they work with the consumer too, and the patient. So let's keep that in mind. Look at the laws of supply and demand. Uh, Mother Laureate Smith said those are God-given laws. So we should keep that in mind. Both wealth and health. Yes. David, you live and practice in Colorado. Yes. Uh, how would a system of socialized medicine, however you choose to define it, yeah. impact your ability to help patients? Peter would be insane. I'm a shoulder and elbow surgeon. I get to operate all over the world. I've uh, traveled and I've taught courses all over. So I engage with surgeons. I've been in operating rooms in Vienna, uh, all over Europe, all over South America, all over Asia. And one thing we know is the truth in socialized medicine, waiting times are disastrous. 
uh, just as with some, some Canadian surgeons, the Canadian healthcare system, the surgeons themselves are very well trained. A lot of them come to America for their fellowships. Um, the average waiting time for someone to seek a specialist in Canada in most provinces is two years. <laughs> two years? Two years. Then, and this, two years. this is coming from Canadian surgeons, there's no, there's no incentive for them to fib about this. And then, once they've seen the patient, they no needs a hip replacement, knee replacement, shoulder replacement. The time to get booked and have your operation is another two years. Okay. And this is province by province. This is what is waiting for Americans to put up with this move to try and get socialized medicine. People in this audience would go crazy if you were told you had to wait four months to see a specialist, right? You guys would have your pitchforks. So no, so, 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 so no Americans in Vermont are getting on a bus to go in on the line in Canada. No, and this is what drove me crazy. I trained in Pennsylvania, and I treated a lot of Canadians. Those with means escape the Canadian system and come to America with joint replacements. In Colorado, I still treat a lot of Canadians. So this is a, there's this escape hatch, which allows them to come to America not put up with this ridiculous system, which would, of course, make the waiting times even longer if everyone stayed trapped. We can't let ourselves be trapped. And how, what are you hearing from your Canadian patients as to, you know, how quickly did they make their judgment to get their cars driving to your uh, studio? Um, it's pretty fast because, you know, but in their mind, they know they have this condition, they're suffering, they can't work, they're not productive, their family needs to pay their bills, they can't get the care they need. Did you know but it's very comparable, comparable rates, if not worse, Canadians going bankrupt because of medical bills. It's this fallacy that it's only a problem in America. We know that the medical healthcare system in America is not perfect. I know that. There are things that need to be done to improve it. Uh, but going socialized is not So I have, I have to ask you only because I mentioned it. You told me on the phone that socialized medicine is one of the causes of the death of Prince Diana. Could you explain? Well, ironically, you guys saw Congressman Scalise, who's a true American hero after he got shot by that Bernie bro. Bernie bro. He was the Bernie bro is not so with brother. excellence yeah. from the moment his injury occurred. Law enforcement was there. He got life flighted out of there. Had surgery immediately. They saved his life. It's a miracle he's alive. It's a miracle he can walk after everything he went through. Almost 20 years ago to the day, 20 years to the day before his injuries when Princess Diana was in that car accident in France. They actually don't have any trauma specialists in France. <laughs> French shoulder surgeons are amazing. I'm friends with plenty of them. But they don't have trauma heritage there. And so for the first hour after her accident, she was still in that car, in that tunnel, in Paris for an hour. And then after an hour, took her to a nearby hospital, and she was alive for another three hours. She was put in control to bleed from her pulmonary artery. Because? Because there were no trauma-trained people there, and because of the delay, we know there's this golden hour that all trauma patients must be treated. And if I really believe, knowing what I know about her care, and comparing it to what Congressman Scalise said, Princess Anna would have lived had that accident happened here in Let's go to the Crown. Mark, Coalition Against Socialized Medicine. Yes. I think we all understand why we need that. People talk about Medicare for all talk. People talk about a Medicare option. People talk about drugs from Canada, a whole variety of, of crazy things. You're talking to elected officials. You're talking to opinion leaders. What do they want to know? What, what moves them on this issue? Well, what we tell them is the threat is real. I mean, we're in a very very serious fight, and if uh, any of you are subjecting yourself to the circus of the democratic debates, you're seeing that the, uh, the idea, the bad idea of socialized medicine used to be on the fringe of the Democratic Party. It's now in the mainstream of the Democratic Party. You're disqualified for running for president as a Democrat if you're not for socialized medicine of some form. So this threat is real. Uh, the, it looks like the leading candidate on their side is the godfather of uh, socialized medicine, so we need to, all of us need to take this threat part of that, That's an offer that we can and must receive. Absolutely. Um, but what's alarming and scary is the polling on this issue. When, when we, we do a, a fair amount of polling, just get done with some of New Hampshire, when you poll on this issue and ask people about 
socialized medicine, they think it's a good idea. The numbers are good for them. Uh, and that's the problem. Uh, but the devil's in the detail. When you start to communicate to folks that it's going to cost $32 trillion over, over 10 years, right? that, that if you have private health insurance that you, the union may have negotiated for you, you're going to lose it. If you're on Medicare, you're not going to have Medicare. Uh, in terms of price control, uh, never worked in any sector. But um, if, if we institute price controls, we're the R&D for the world in the United States. So that's going to basically shut down any development of new medicines and new cures. You know, the, the, the quality of care is going to go down. Um, and at the end of the day, the government's going to dictate choices for your health care. So when, you, when we pull in and add that information, the numbers move dramatically. So the bad news for us is, on the surface, when they run out with the line, you know, Medicare for all is a great idea, we're losing. But ultimately, we can win the fight. We just got to educate folks, and that's what our coalition. But, well, let me pick up on that because one of the things that Bernie and his ilk are against are patents. Patents deliver innovation, patents deliver competition. Barbara, you're the expert here. What happens when you erase? competition and intellectual property rights in healthcare. Well, then you destroy capitalism. Patents is nothing else as a protection of property rights. And to have and to protect property rights is what we, as what you in the United States and in the, in the US have done the entire ever since it exists. Whereas we in Europe, we don't care about property rights anymore. And this is why we don't care about capitalism. And without or, capitalism, or, or we don't create wealth. We, do, we are not innovative. We are not better than any others. We don't outperform yeah. others. And we are not what we want to stand for. We are not free, of course. And not independent. And that's, I think, what everybody here in this room wants to do. You know, for, many, for many, many years, the language of uh, science, certainly the language of pharmaceutical, was German. Well, it isn't German anymore, is it? It is not, because German companies had to go away. They all left Europe because of the bad conditions for them. Not only because of tax, but what is most important, you mentioned briefly, innovation, research and development. This is here in the United States now, and guess who creates jobs? I might jump on that, Peter. You know, the medical device industry in America is one of the great manufacturing sectors in, sectors in the world. The medical device industry is a massive net exporter in our country. You know, if you're an American here and you had your joint replaced, it is a guarantee that that joint replacement was made in America. There's no American who's made a hip replacement, knee replacement, shoulder replacement that was made in Asia. Not at all. Asia is a massive importer of our medical devices, our cardiac stents, our joint replacement, our pacemakers, employees, hundreds of thousands of Americans, and it's based on that intellectual property it allows us to be that research engine that drives the world. So Bernie Sanders said that we should replace the patent system with a prize system. You come up with a great idea, you device, you drug, pick your product, and you'll get paid for that, and then the, patent, the, the rights go to the government. You know where that's worked, ladies and gentlemen? Nowhere. The last time I can remember a patent being taken from an award was Robert Goddard's rocketry patents. You know, for Goddard, that didn't work out so good. You know, so, so Mark, uh, coming back to you, 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 the, you are elected representatives, you are thought leaders. Can they put together all these pieces and go beyond the sound bites? Oh, they, they get it. There's no question they get it. We're fortunate to have the folks we have, like Steve, Steve Scalise in Congress. Because they're in there fighting every day, and we're doing what we can to support them. But um, you know, I met—I want to say—I met a gentleman last night from Canada here. He's going to speak, I think, Saturday. And they said, "How's the health care?" He said, "It's awesome. I get—I get twenty-five dollars. I get this great card. It's only bad when I get sick." <laughs> so um, you know, it's—it's it, it's a challenge, and, and and I know everyone in this room, all of us face health challenges, either personally or with our families. It's a difficult thing. And, and, and my own personal experience, um, I have a, a, a daughter who five years ago was diagnosed with thyroid cancer, stage four thyroid cancer. Very suddenly, she was in her senior year at college at TCU. And my wife and I, fortunately my wife's a nurse, we had to react quickly because, because the endocrinologist said that she needs surgery immediately. So when we got over the stage of being stunned, we immediately uh, sought out the best 
the best uh, doctors we could, and specifically the best surgeons we could, identified those folks, and literally went and interviewed them. Uh, we live in Austin, Texas, and we're close to, to uh, MD Anderson in Houston, which was very fortunate for us. We identified great doctors who did surgery on my daughter. They, uh, they literally wheeled her in at 6 a.m. They told us that, Mark, uh, we'll be done by noon. Um, at 1.30 they came out, and the surgeon told me, uh, I've got three more hours to go. This is the worst case I've seen in 30 years, and your daughter's had cancer since she was a very little girl. My wife and I were obviously stunned and tried to process that information, but the moral of the story is this. The surgery was 10 hours. She was healthy. Five years out, she's cancer-free. She's working on the health of the So here's a guy, just a guy. His wife happens to be a healthcare professional. They're in a difficult situation. They get the chance in Texas, in the United States, to interview the surgeons, oncological surgeons. They get the chance to interview them. So does that happen all the time in Europe? No. No, you enter a hospital and then you see Dr. X or Dr. Y, unless you have a private insurance, unless you make sure that you are educated enough to make the choice and do it, organize it yourself. It's not, it's not the way that it works here in the United States. So the thing is, I'm talking about cancer. Exactly, at present. Exactly, at present. And talking about cancer, there is lots of evidence in studies that cancer patients have to wait a very long time, months sometimes, until they're able to get treatment. And those months are very dangerous because, uh, you know, with cancer, Your was on the with cancer you have to work immediately. You have to react immediately. But, you know, socialized health care doesn't allow that. So the queues are literally, they are not going to be in the hospitals, in the French hospitals, even in German hospitals. Everywhere where we have this system, it's very bad for the consumer or the patient. They don't want to pursue this patient choice proposition. So we have health insurance, which many hundreds of millions of Americans have. We have health sharing, which is increasingly a, a solid choice for many Americans. But you get to make that choice. You get to decide what you need in your life. David, relative to a lot of your patients, nobody's planning far in advance blow out their shoulder, right. or blow out their elbow, or blow out their knee. What happens, it requires immediate action. What happens when you say, you know what, that's awful, I'm sorry you're in pain, here's a band-aid. Right. You know, I'll see you in two years. Can you imagine that? I mean, if you, if you knew that you, you've just been told, look, your knee is so far gone, the arthritis is so advanced, it tends not to slowly creep up on patients. And anyone who's had their knee replaced, an audience will say, yeah, that's right, my knee kind of hurt. Then all of a sudden one day I couldn't take the pain anymore. It was terrible. I think the bottom point is this. You know, this for several days here at CPAC, we're going to be talking about socialism versus America versus freedom. And versus choice. Versus choice. And nothing is more personal than your own body, your own health, and the health of your loved ones. And some of these things are pie in the sky, and the thought of uh, maybe someone losing their patent rights, you can't really feel it, but can you imagine in your bodies, the government's gonna get in control and tell you who you have to go to. We've been fit to before, that you can choose your doctor, right? We all, we all were told that lie. Imagine taking it up many notches, that you're gonna have to follow and obey and do what doctors say. So, so this becomes, if you like your health insurance, if you like your doctor, you can keep it as long as we say it's okay. Or as long as they're on the list, some magic government list. Right. right? Mark, let me go back to you. So a lot of times uh, during the Democrat debate, you'll hear, well, we want to level the playing field. But what they mean is they want to level the playing field with, with dynamite and, and atomic weapons. Uh, what about a Medicare option? People say, that sounds, that sounds pretty fair. But, but what people don't understand is if you allow the government to provide health care, sell health care across state lines, but private insurance can't do that. What about allowing private insurance companies to maximize the economy of scale and sell policies across state lines? Somehow that additional soundbite 
<laughs> is not going to work. What, what do, how, do we, how do we break through this bubble of bullshit? <laughs> You're talking logically now, so logically and logical, the Democrats in the same sentence. But I'm going to tell everyone a secret in here and don't tell anybody. All the Democratic candidates want to get to single payer eventually. That's the goal, that's the objective. It's long been their objective. Say, say, yes, that, again. say, say, say that again. They, all of those candidates, Mayor Pete, whatever his last name is, all the Biden, all the candidates, <laughs> they all have the same agenda. Bernie wants to start faster and be more dramatic to be politically expedient. Buttigieg and, and Biden and the others are, are saying, well, you'll have this, you'll have an option to buy insurance uh, you know, in a private way, which is not real. And, and they want to get the single payer eventually. So that's why I don't believe any of that narrative. They're going for it all. That's why this fight is serious. That's why we need everyone in this room engaged. Barbara, look back on a more, our more economic level. Let me exaggerate for a moment. Innovative drugs and devices not coming from Europe. Investment dollars not going to Europe. Talent coming into the U.S. What am I missing here? Well, we are in a damn difficult situation. I don't, to be honest, we will end up probably as the history and tourism the center if we don't wake up. We, and we have made a lot of mistakes in the past. Um, well, most of them were all with the socialist idea of making everything the same. One, five, one size fits all, and it doesn't. Because we are all individualists. We all have our different talents, we have our difficult issues, different issues, and it doesn't work to provide the same solution to everybody. We need different individual solutions, whether it's in healthcare, whether it's in education, whether it's in transport, it, 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 so it seems as though Europe, broadly we define, Austria certainly, they've somehow managed to successfully disincentivize all of these things. Why? Well, there was what a was reason, the plan? There was a reason why Hayek wrote the Road to Serfdom in 1944. You got Road to Serfdom, actually written for humans to read, short, worthwhile. The, 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 the Reader's Digest version, look at the cartoons, they are still up today. So what he wrote back then, yeah. careful what centrally organized institutions, left-wing or uh, states, Socialized, socialist, and communist. So the road. They will destroy you. So the, the road to socialized medicine is the super highway of the road to serfdom. Exactly. So this is why we need to be very careful and don't fall into this trap and not make the same mistakes as the Europeans have made because it costs you dollars and dollars and dollars. Oh, wait a minute. Look at the European budgets. I just this. I only have to say that. You're saying we should actually look to Europe learn what not to do. Exactly. Exactly. Don't fall into those traps. Don't make the same mistakes. Because you want to outcompete other nations. You want to be better than other nations. And you don't want to be I, middle. I like that a lot better than looking to Cuba for what to do. <laughs> Just because you like the country. Well, you know, there's value in getting a nice man. Okay. So, so David, uh, your patients come in. What if you said to them, uh, we, have, uh, we have to wait for the MRI. But I've looked at your MRI, and um, you know, you're gonna, well, I can't really use these new devices that are available. I'll have to kind of use the old-fashioned stuff. How quickly would they stay in your office? They, they lose their mind. By the way, so there are 10 million, 11 million Cubans in the entire country. There are four MRI machines, none of which are modern, right? There are, in Cuba, in the country of Cuba, there are four MRI machines within a mile of here, probably. One thing I realized in the writing of my book, the invention of surgery, is that there's always been a world capital of medical innovation. And it, you know, it used to be the ancient Greeks, and then went to Italy, and then for a while, late 1800s, it was Germany and Austria. Barbara knows that I'm a huge fan of Vienna. Then, World War II happened. The world headquarters, the place where all the innovation was happening, was America. And while that happened, you had transistors invented, plastic invented, modern metal alloys were intended, all American, and that's all happened in America, pacemaker, most 
advanced kind of joint replacement. It's an American miracle that this implant revolution happened, and we can't get in the way of that because we're on the cusp of even greater Okay, so we have, we have three minutes left, and I'd like to ask each of you a question. Mark, let, let me start with you. What is it going to take to get our side of the conversation off of basically, like Doug said, being boring? Now, when are we going to get off our get off our guts and start telling the harsh truths here? Oh, it, it's a challenge because you know we're the heartless people that don't want to give everyone uh, quality health care. So it's a challenge. So as I said earlier, the good news is when we go to those other arguments and make get people to focus and listen on to those other points, we win. So that that is the challenge, and organizations like ours are, are trying to amplify those themes and be aggressive. Certainly, our members of Congress, everyone in this room has a part to play on this issue. We need everyone's help. Just keep communicating with folks. Say, look at it. What does it really mean? What does it really involve? Well, look, what's the message to these people in this room? They're engaged. They're they're hungry. They're aggressive. They're smart. What should they be telling their elected representatives? You should be telling them the votes, obviously. They, they don't want to pay higher taxes. They don't. They don't want to lose their private insurance. They want to have control in, of, of their medical decisions for them and their family. They don't want bad price controls to, to stifle innovation, and they want to have quality health care. And none of that can be achieved through the burning program. No way. Thank you. Barbara. High taxes. Mediocre care. Central planning. When's it going to change? When's it going to change in Europe? When are you guys going to get with the program? When we hit the wall, I hope not, but, uh, but you missed one thing, lack of innovation. And lack of competition. Yes. And so when you, when you look at the U.S., do you see innovation, do you see competition, do you see a system that rewards that? Yes. And we have to protect still, I still do. And as an economist, I look at the facts and figures and numbers. And if we look at those and compare those, then you outperform many other nations. And I just tell you, First of all, the second even get better and not fall into the traps that we do, that we have done in Europe by repeating the same mistakes over and over again. It doesn't help. They don't, you don't find solutions just because you do one thing once again and you knew it didn't work out 10 years ago or 20 years ago and just try again. It still won't work. We don't want to import drugs. We don't want to import socialism. And we don't want to import a lack of innovation and competition. Exactly. David, you're, you're actually suiting up every day. Yep. What's going to help you do a better job going forward? How can government help? Uh, allow competition. You know, we believe in life, liberty, pursuit of happiness. John Locke says life, liberty, and property. We can't let people feed upon our life and liberty. Ladies and gentlemen, Mark Block, the Barber Fund, David Snyder.